All right, well, first of all, I want to thank the Mitchell Institute for inviting me to talk. It's always great to be back. Um, and when, when I got the call and they said, we want you to talk the space power for warfighters, I was initially like, well, wait a minute, I, 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 don't, I don't do space. But then I looked at the folks that were going to attend and I said, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> you know, you all probably remember that when I first went out to work Mill SATCOM, I said I didn't know anything about space. And then when they sent me to the NRO, I said, I really still don't know much more about space. And then they sent me back out to SMC. And so I guess I can't say I don't know anything <laughs> about space anymore. But it has been. It's hard for me to believe, but it's actually been three years since I left SMC. Um, and I felt, I ha you know, not to, to toot my own horn, but I, I actually felt pretty good leaving SMC that I had left things in better shape than when I got there and was pretty proud of our successes. When I looked at um, the fact that, that we now had a Sibbers constellation not just one satellite, not just no satellites like it was when I left. And we had advanced EHF flying and close to an NAO an initial operating capability. And wideband global SATCOM was now uh, hugely successful. Um, but I have to admit there was a little part of me that was bothered in that. Uh, there was a couple of key programs that and despite all of my efforts to try to be success, to, to make successful, I left without feeling comfortable about where they were. And th those two programs were JSPOC Mission Systems and OCX. Sorry, Lynn. <laughs> um, and the thing about both of those, the commonality about both of those, was the, they were key software programs. And the other thing about both of those was that both of them had been touted as applications of agile software development. That's how we started them, with great enthusiasm and excitement. And three or four years later, we were looking at huge overruns or delays or uh, uh, just ineffectiveness in some way. And so um, I, I kind of still kept that in the back of my mind, but I thought, well, OK onto a new job, you know, I, I won't have to be worrying so much about software development in this job because it's an organized, trained, equipped job. And then, and then we got a new chief. And I have to tell you, a really exciting chief because he gets it when it comes to war fighting. And he laid out a vision and he says, you know, the successful commander in 2030 is the commander that can command and control multiple domains, providing effects from different domains at the speed that which our adversary is overwhelmed and not knowing where the next attack is coming from. At the same time, we deny him the ability to do that. And I thought about that and I said, boy, going to need a lot of SATCOM when you think about that going to need to be able to quickly change and adapt to be able to do that. And then he came to me, you know, as the organized, trained, equipped, or what you might say, the senior uniformed person in acquisition. He says, Ellen, I need your help here because we have to rethink about how we do acquisition. We need to think about not stovepipe pieces of hardware, but we need to think about a network of apps and apertures. So I'm thinking to myself, OK, I'm going to need that comm again. But oh my goodness, remember that agile software development stuff that, that I kind of was frustrated that we hadn't uh, been successful at? Boy, if I can't do software with agility and the ability to be able to think about this as a network, think about that. The heart of it is going to be, of course, you know, the physics, the engineer in me says, I need RF. You know, the network's got to be able to carry signals from one place to another. But the heart of that is, is that brain trust called the software. And if I, I have to, so it became one of my personal things to go back and look at this agile software development again and, and ask myself, what happened? Why were we not able to implement that? And by the way, I learned as I got to, AFMC that the space business was not alone 
at being able to apply agile software development. So no longer was, this was back on my forefront of my activities. And then of course, along with this, this charter that, the, that General Goldfein gave to me in terms of looking at how do we change the way we think about our acquisition, he also chartered something called a multi-domain command and control um, enterprise capability. And if you start to talk, again, really back about that adversary, if you're talking about multi-domain command and control, then I got to talk about integrating a bunch of stuff together that I haven't really done very well in the past. And guess who he put in charge of working that multi-domain command and control? He put a space officer in charge of it because in the space business, we understand that better I think than many of the other domains do because it is so critical to us because of the distance between our command and control capability and what we're trying to command and control. Think about it, right? We worry in the air business about being beyond, using beyond line of sight comm. Well, in the space business, we don't even think about line of sight comm, right? It's all distances. So it all starts to come together that, that this, the ability of us as a Department of Defense to use, to be agile in our software development is critical. Then add to that the growth in the cost associated with software when it comes to our weapon systems. And I always, the first place this hit me with, by the way, was um, when I was working MIL SATCOM and we started to look at, where's Al Ballinger, the amount of software code on GPS-3 the code on orbit versus something like the original discus satellites, which were bent pipes, or even the first GPS, right? And you realize that there is software is the, at the heart of most of what we do. So I'm a kind of back to basics kind of person. So I said, all right, if I'm going to understand this agile software development, I better, I need to understand what it really means. Because is it a buzzword? Because, you know, everybody loves to throw it out there, right? But what is it really about? So I actually did a little bit of homework, and it turns out that it started back in 2001 when a bunch of software development minds got together at a ski resort in Utah um, and said that, that they were trying to steer the way we do software development away from the traditional way. And you know, which was documentation driven, heavy software development processes. And, and, and so they said, okay, we're going to establish 12 guiding principles. And so I thought, well, this is good. I can compare their guiding principles to what my objectives are when we talk about providing warfighter capability. Well, the first one is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of, of valuable software. Oh, I like that one, right? Who could argue about that one for anything we do? The second one is welcoming changing requirements, even late in development. Agile processes harness change to customers' competitive advantage. Ooh, ooh, what does that mean when a traditional acquisition, you know, in our mindset, right? Requirements, stable requirements, that's what we beat. So, but this one's a little different. But I will tell you, in my experience, stable requirements are non-existent as far as we try. So this is saying kind of like I'm an old, you know, I have a black belt in Taekwondo and you always talk about, you know, when something comes out of force, how do you use that force to your advantage as opposed to trying to oppose it? Well, this says take the fact that requirements change and use it to your advantage. So I like that one, right? The third one was deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with preference to shorter time scales. Well, yeah. okay. Um, business people and developers must work together daily through the project. I like that one. Not so sure we do that, do we? Where we, uh, you know, we've got multiple layers between the guy who's actually going to operate when they say the business people and the guy who's writing the code, don't we? We get, even, even within the government, we got operators over here and acquirers over there. So that one may take a little work. Build projects around motivated individuals and give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Trust. We heard that term before in terms of acquisition, right? 
Um, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Well, I like that. Working software. This one is the one I really love. Working software is the primary measure of progress. Yeah, I love it. I don't care how much paper you got. Give me a piece of software that works, right? Um, Agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. A constant pace, not build up to a milestone and then build up to another milestone. Just keep on going, keep running. I, as a chemical engineer, the best thing you do is to have a steady state process, right? One that doesn't start up and start and shut down are the highest risks, right, when you're doing that. Uh, continuous attention to technical excellence. Oh yeah, quality, right? And you now mission assurance for the space guys, right? And good design enhances agility. Simplicity. Keep it simple. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. I love it. The, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Remember those IPTs we used to talk about and pulling them together to get the right people? And, the, and then finally, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective and then tunes and adjusts the behavior. And um, so this is the kind of the process for agile software development. You plan it, you build it, you launch it, and you get feedback. And you do this constantly. And then you keep that thing running, you think about that wheel running. Um, and if we look, if we go to the next chart, Yara. And, and so then I started to look at who's done this really well and been very successful. Well, Google, for example, um, they have, uh, they, they, they have, they, they, they obviously live on software and they, predent, they do software releases multiple times per week. <laughs> multiple times per week. Think about us with the pros cycles that we have. Facebook. The Facebook mm -hmm. users upload more than 2.4 billion content items daily. And their software engineers are delivering changes to their production environment. And all of us are, are Facebook users. I'm, all of us that are Facebook users have no idea they're doing this, right? They are doing it 50 times per day. They're making software changes 50 times a day. And if you might say, okay, that's all, you know, information, you know, social media, who cares about the risk? John Deere recently said that they were going to adopt this. And in 2012, they actually hired eight, they now actually have 800 software developers it, that use an agile process. And they use this as a way to be more responsive to their customers and they're attractors. They're, you know, but they recognize the value of the software on theirs. And Amazon, they went on record in 2011 that they were going to release software updates every 11.6 seconds. Well, in 2014, they deployed 50 million software changes. That's one software release every second over the course of the year. And they do it. And we never see Amazon. How often in the last year have you known that Amazon totally crashed, right? Now, uh, TomTom, Navigation, they took the fail fast approach and they, would, they were producing software every two weeks. One to two million lines of code per navigation product. So, and they have 750 to 1,000 engineers across 11 development sites. So, so you look at this and you say, you know, there's obviously success here. These are all companies that have been very successful. So why can't I get that success? And, you know, we've got some examples within the government where, where we have done agile software development. And I think, you know, under the previous administration, we really embraced this uh, DIUX and defense digital services. And uh, frankly, a lot of what DDS is trying to do is to, is to introduce software development. But now the next step is, okay, I want some of this, right? I've seen it successful. I like the basic tenets, so why can't I do it? So I go back. And uh, Lynn's sitting here, and she will resonate with this one. Um, we, when I looked at all the things that we were doing on OCX, on JSPOC mission systems, on uh, AOC 10.2, which is an air one, um, I've come up with this set of what I call the barriers that um, are, frankly, 90% cultural 
Um, 5% things the DOD did to themselves and, and Chairman, 5% of what the Congress has done to us. So let's talk about this. The first one is the one that I think Lynn will relate with me. We are very much enamored with our system engineering processes in the Department of Defense. Systems Engineering V, by golly, it works, we're successful. We have processes that drive us to go all the way down, starting with requirements and going all the way back up and testing and rigorous testing. Well, about the second week I was on the job at SMC, I would learn that OCX had failed their preliminary design review. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how could you fail a preliminary design review? I mean, that's one of the initial steps, except that Preliminary design reviews don't make any sense when you're doing agile software development. Because remember, agile software development is all about getting stuff capability out there. And the systems engineering V drives you to this detailed requirements flow down. And then you write the system, the software development process. And then you do a, what is the PDR for? Is it for that first uh, scrum, that first rapid fielding of software? So the first thing that we need to do, or we could then go to the what we call the waterfall model for software development, which is another one that is this very structured way. And in these cases, you don't start writing code until you've already wrote sometimes thousands of pages, pa pieces of paper. And you do this detailed requirements flow down. And remember the tenant number two, that requirements are gonna change? So the systems engine, by, by forcing our software uh, our contractors and by implementing this into these these models for systems engineering we have essentially negated two to three of the basic tenets of agile software development and and make it very difficult for for um, our, our, our programs to succeed so barrier number one that I think we need to do is we have to we have to change the way we think about systems engineering. We have to change the way we think about requirements um, definition and, um, as we go into software, as if we're going to really adopt agile software development. Maybe the answer isn't this detail requirements flow down. If you think about you want to deliver working software fast, maybe we slice it this way instead of digging deeply into it that way. That's really what agile software development folks do. They get the they, they continue to field capability, and they do it by, maybe all the requirements aren't met at the first one, but you have something that functions that you can put in the hands of the operator, and they can use it, and oh, by the way, once you put it in the hands of the operator, maybe some of those requirements you had in the beginning, maybe they're not, they don't make any sense anymore, because the operator sees how they can actually use this, and they change it. Okay, so that's the first one. The next thing is, um, you remember that thing about putting the, acquire, the, operate, the coder and the <laughs> user together? Um, well, we don't do that either. You know, we, we have a, an industry guy that sits over in his facility in Colorado, or, and then we have the operator that's trying to do this in Colorado Springs, and, and we don't let that operator see that software until it goes through development test and then it goes through an independent operational test, and then we finally let the guy who's actually going to use the code get his hands on it. Well, that violates the other tenet of let's get everybody together, that face-to-face -face communication, um, and get that and, and turn that cycle fast. And here's where I remember when I was, um, when I was working uh, JSPOC mission systems. Um, first of all, requirements have to, you have to have flexibility in requirements, right? And JSPOC mission systems recognize that when it was first started. And in fact, the original premise was that Lieutenant General Susan Helms as the primary operator and Lieutenant General Ellen Polakowski as the primary acquirer would, would share this requirements group. And we would make the decision on which requirements we're going to go into essentially the next scrum, if you will, the next release. <coughs> And we were going to release software. I know this is slow for Agile software, but basically at six-month intervals. So somebody decided, oh, no, 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 no. This is a high-priority program, really important program. Um, it's going to be called an ACAT-1, and therefore requirements have to be run through the JROC. <coughs> oh, my God. Now, what happened to that 
Now, and I just shook my head because now we have a three star who's in charge of space operations and we cannot trust that three star in charge of space operations to determine what the requirements should be. And we can't trust the, the three star in charge of, of executing it to know whether we can execute those or not because we now had to go through OIPTs and DABs for the decisions. So we violated the basic premise in that one. And then when we sat down to say, okay, we've got to test this stuff, our six month scrums, remember, we're doing this all, delivering in six months? <clears throat> Afotech said it was going to take them 18 months to do the OT and produce the report and provide their recommendation. Yeah. Right? So we have to empower at the right level. And that has to be at the level of the person that's going to do, going to use the software. And we have to stop thinking about independent OT. What does that mean? Um, it, just, it, it just doesn't make sense when you think about being able to agilely be responsive with software. And we talk about, remember those timelines, that the, we need to be able to provide multiple effects from multiple domains at the speed that totally overwhelms our adversary. That means that General Saltzman's multi-domain command and control system has to be flexible enough to be able to adapt its, um, the tools it has, which is the software. It has to have somebody sitting side by side with them to be able to make adjustments. Mm -hmm. And in the space business, some of you will remember what way back when it was engineers that were sitting at those command and control terminals, right? And writing code, right? Back when. So, so we, have to get, we have to get those barriers out of there. We've got to do it. And now the other issue is we hold on to stuff too long. And then we end up having to try to figure out how to connect a dinosaur to a jet airplane and, and we slow th you know, we slow everything else down instead of just saying, and you know, an example of that come, becomes AOC 10.2 where we have all these multiple stovepiped software pieces that we want to keep. And, and when you started to look what happened to that program, you ended up with <laughs> your system being totally bogged down because every time you made a change there was 50 different stovepipe priority software pieces that had to be addressed. So sometimes it's better just throw the old stuff away. Sorry, but in my opinion, that's, that's what we got to do. Um, and then the other one, my little gentleman there with all of his stuff on is, <coughs> frankly, we, we have a zero risk tolerance culture. And in the space business, that is true in spades. Now, don't get me wrong. I, like all the other SMC commanders between me and 1999, did not want to be f the first SMC commander to certify a launch that failed. So I bowed to the mission assurance gods three times a day <laughs> and made sure, you know, that we were ready to go. However, that risk aversion is caused us to layer checkers on top of checkers <laughs> and, and slow down our processes to the extent where we aren't, we, there's no way we can speed up that. So we have to be able to understand, to be temper our appetite for risk mitigation um, if we're going to be able to do this. We ha and that gets back to empowering two three stars to make decisions about what something needs how something should, can be operated or even at a lower level I put it to you than that um, then the other thing that we have is this idea that pro that software is developed and then sustained what the heck does that mean remember that thing about this is a continuous process and number of times that I get bogged down in these discussions that, that I say, well, okay, well, we're going to this contractor to develop the software and we're going to require all the data rights so we can compete the sustainment. <coughs> Remember when I told you how many software engineers that, um, that they hired at, uh, at John Deere and Goldman Sachs has 800 of them? And they don't, they, they live there, they own that. They have sophomore teams for life. This isn't a, okay, we developed this thing and now, how do you sustain software? Software doesn't break. You may find something that doesn't work the way you thought it was, but it doesn't break. 
you don't bring it in for you know corrosion mitigation or overhauling the engines. When you look at what we really do in software sustainment, a lot of it is continually improving the software, right? So because of that, um, we, we also get ourselves bogged down in this color of money. And this is where I think you all can help us. You know, if you go down to Rich Aldridge, at, who runs the business systems, and if there's anywhere in the Air Force that we should be able to do agile software development, it's in business systems, right? And he will tell you that he ends up constantly being bogged down because someone will decide that that's research and development money that needs to be spent to do that software thing that, that his customer wants. And he doesn't have any research and development money. He only has O&M because that particular system was in sustainment, right? And we do sustainment in O&M. And oh, by the way, it's a two-year process to get into the POM. And if you have RDT and E, then you get categorized as some kind of ACAP program. And therefore, you now remember that systems engineering V, because you're going to have to have a systems engineering plan, and you're going to have to have all this other stuff. And you may even have to go through a, a DAB to get the thing approved. And all of a sudden, where did my agility go, right? And all I wanted to do was to make something you know, a little bit better. And I'll give you an example of one I just went through with this. Our simulation simulators, our aircraft simulators, key and essential to the future of the Air Force is to be able to do live virtual constructive training. We cannot, we can't, first of all, we can't afford to continue to fly airplanes and big exercises. And second, so with some of our sophisticated weapons and capability, we really can do that more effectively by doing it with virtual and simulation. But our simulators were all built separately with proprietary software and code and oh by the way we have this thing called cybersecurity and each one of them has cyber vulnerabilities so we came up with a strategy that puts them into a common architecture <coughs> and which actually will help us with cybersecurity as well and an approach of doing this with agile software development and we would eventually get them all in um, <laughs> and we came up with a strategy for doing this using our sustainment dollars because we have to address those um, those cyber vulnerabilities, because that's a broken software, right? That, that's not new capability. But in the process of doing all this, we're going to really improve and enhance this, right? We're going to improve the flexibility of it. We can actually incorporate some, some new capabilities in. And the, the lawyers and the FMers came to the conclusion that I can use O&M to do this only if when the pilot walks into the simulator, he sees no difference. As long as I can get away with that, it's okay, I don't need RDT any money. Well, is this absurd or not? I mean, but this is all back to this whole concept. So if we go to the next chart, um, let me see if I missed any other barriers. I think I hit the highlights because I want to get into the, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to eliminate disruptive organizational barriers. And I call this, for lack of a better word, the Goldman Sachs model. We need to bring the coders and the operators together. And, and I am not saying that this, you know, the immediate reaction that I, when I told General Goldfein this, he goes, do you mean I need software squadrons? And I'm like, well, yeah, but I don't want you to think about this squadron in the traditional sense where everybody's wearing this kind of uniform, right? I think these, these sophomore teams that will be co-located with, with the guys that are doing the operations could be a combination of blue suitors, <coughs> civilians, an industry team. I don't care. I want the best people. Remember that self-forming teams, right? That's the most effective way to do it. So I am looking at implementing strategies where we actually co-locate and, and use, a certain extent, internal software coders. I learned as I was going through this, you know, I, we have 3,000 software coders in AFMC. They work in our air logistics centers. They write the, OF, the uh, operational flight profiles out at Hill. They write code out at Robbins that goes into the DCGS. So we're already doing this, but those guys are not trained. They're, they don't do agile software development, which, by the way, is a problem when I'm trying to hire new people because all the people coming out of, out of our universities only understand agile software development. So I'm having to bring them in and untrain them in Agile and train them back to that systems engineering V and all that paperwork. And you think I have trouble recruiting them? Yeah. 
You know, they don't want to be bogged down with all this, the hoodies, as we, you know, we sometimes say, they don't want to bog down with that. So we have to, so this is an organizational change. This is a thinking about how, uh, and, but think about all the other barriers. I got to overcome this independent tester. I, um, but I think this is where I say 90% of that is internal. It's cultural. We have to change. We have to look at how we do our contracts that enable us to do that. I hate to say this, but maybe it's time for time and material contracts again, that I have the agility to figure out, and I know that's blasphemous when we talk about, you know, you know, bad contracting strategies, but I have to have the agility in my contracts to be responsive as those requirements change. Okay, the second thing is, okay, so I put the teams to, and the teams are there for life, and I don't mean that it's one person, but we don't think about, okay, we only put this team together to do the, the development and they're out the door. You know, that team stays with that piece of, that, with that system uh, forever. Maybe that's why when I put this in the terms of, for someone like General Goldfring, then maybe the right thing is to say, yeah, I'm gonna have software squadrons. There are gonna be places where there will be an organization that will do that. Um, okay, we need to make the user the operational tester and acceptance authority. We've got to eliminate this independent tester, and that's one that is kind of in that 5%, sir, because, you know, the DOT&E role is, is, is in law, not something. But we, we, have to, we have to be able, you know, the Defense Digital Service tells you the guys, you know, they go out, and you put the software in there, and the guy who wrote the software is leaning over the shoulder of the operator. And when something goes wrong, he says, oh, I know where that is, because he knows the code. He didn't have this stack of software that was, or this documentation that was developed when the contract was delivered, right? He knows the code. It's his. Um, we need to, um, we need to uh, get over this dollar thing, this color of money thing. And, and, and I don't really care how we do this. Um, you know, people say, well, let's just do it all with O&M. Um, that becomes the trust issue because the issue is, you know, ONM has the least restrictions on it in terms of, of it. And, you know, how do we trust you? You know, that's what the FMers tell me. That's what the staffers tell me. How do we trust you? So I don't care if you don't trust me with ONM, then maybe we need software production money. Like we have aircraft production money and we have sa space satellite production money. Maybe we, you know, in the Air Force vernacular, we have 30, 10, 30, 20. Maybe we need 30, 90 where it's software production. And, and we do it with, so, with a separate color of money. But we have to overcome that barrier. Uh, we have to reframe that systems engineering process so that uh, it isn't as hardware centric. And we have to transition, this is back to me, the task, remember that started me on all this when, the, when my boss told me, we need a net centric approach to managing systems instead of stove pipe weapon systems. And this gets back to how are we organized to do acquisition? I have a B2 SPO. I have a, an F22 SPO. Um, so when poor Linda Rutledge is trying to figure out how to pull these simulators together, she has to go to all these different, different entities. So that's a deeper one for me to contemplate and think about, but how do we eliminate, how do, if we're really gonna be a network centric in how we think about our warfighting capability, we're gonna have to, I think kind of have to think a little bit about how we define in the Air Force, how we define a weapon system and how we organize to support it. Because right now, the <laughs> network is the tail on the dog. And, and, and the weapon systems are the, are the big, you know, that, the ones that call the shots. Just think about the challenges we've always had at getting new GPS capability on our, uh, on our platforms, right? Well, we only do it when it fits into the schedule for the, for the hardware. That's not going to work, in an, right? So that's, that's where we are there. So how are we going to do this? Some of it is cultural. Some of it, we're going to have to drive changes in DOD and Air Force <laughs> policy. Um, I've been pushing to try to get a couple pathfinders and pilots going so that we can demonstrate this. Um, um, and I think there are some legislative things that we can do that will help with these barriers. But I think if, but I don't see any of these as insurmountable. But more importantly, I see them as critical if we are going to be able to continue 
to provide the kind of war fighting capability with the agility and the flexibility that we're going to need for this country. So um, you probably, this is the first time you've heard me talk about this, but you know, this is going to, you're going to hear me about this again and again and again, because this is so critically important. And it's not just for space. And frankly, it's across the whole Department of Defense. It's not just for, not just for space. So with that, I will um, open it up to questions. I'm going to ask Tony Bloomberg, so Tony, the first question, then you can do Okay. Your own. Tony, do you have a question? You no. You oh, my, it. Tony, you don't have a question? <laughs> You'll make one up. The Air Force yesterday canceled the Northrop AOC contract because of software issues, and how does that fit in your notion of what problem needs to be solved with your education? That is exactly, that, pro, that, that program, that that capability is at the heart of what we're talking about here. That is actually uh, one of the, the uh, program, I don't even want to call it a program, because but that, that capability that we're trying to get into the AOC, that 10.2 represented, is, uh, is one of the key drivers to tackling these issues. And uh, we, we have a, uh, under Darlene Costello, there is a, Pathfinder that we are kicking off uh, that tries to capture a lot of the things we talked about here. How much does this cancellation throw back your efforts? Not at all. Not at all. The, because remember, the requirements are still there, right? So I have the opportunity now to try to get after those requirements using an agile software development construct as opposed to a traditional okay, I have this big ACAT1 program here that's going to cost this bazillion dollars that's going to take this amount of time and I can't start it until I have a dab and, and get approval through the POM. We're going we're gonna to start to get after those requirements using an agile software development construct even as we're speaking here. <coughs> Um, well, there's, there, are, there are elements of it that we will continue, that we will be able to use um, in the, a, a, as we go forward, uh, some, particularly some of the work that's gone in the last, the last time period. But um, uh, it, it, it was, it, I mean, I, I, Tony, I don't have the details as to exactly what all the money was spent on, but but we, we will not, not all of it's going to be completely thrown away. We'll be able to use uh, parts of it, particularly the architecture that was started, the work that was started on as we go forward. Okay? Question here. Wilson Brissett from Air Force Magazine. General, do you think the formation of a separate Space Corps could help this process development, uh, streamline the acquisition? Um, make things faster in the way that you say they need to be? What we're trying to do here has to be done regardless of what the overall organizational structure is and I, um, I, I don't have any, um, I frankly think that we, we can do what we need to do and work within whatever construct um, you know, we decide as a nation is the best way to go when it comes to that. You know, Latif and the Secretary have laid out, been very clear about where they think, uh, think we should be going, and my focus has been to try to, to make sure that the acquisition community can provide that ad agility that, that's needed to provide the capabilities we need in space. And so, uh, with the things I talked about here, a lot of this is at the tactical acquisition level when you think about it. And so I'm very comfortable with going forward under the current construct with this and we'll adapt and adjust as decisions are made. Hi, Valerie Hi. Sinow with Defense News. Nice to see you, General. Um, I had a question also about AOC 10.2. I was wondering if you could provide some information about why the Air Force decided to cancel Northrop's contract. Um, I'm, I'm asking just because when OCX was running into pr problems, and you guys started doing the DevOps uh, software development. 
for that, you guys kept Raytheon on board. So I was wondering, you know, what was the difference between those two programs? Uh, well, they were they were at different phases <laughs> in in where they were, and the assessment that was made uh, when we looked at both programs was that that the best opportunity to get the capability was in OCX was to get to stay the course. And in fact, in the OCX program today, there's been active involvement by help, if you will, from the Defense Digital Service at applying some of the techniques that we've talked about here. The decision in the case of AOC was to, to, to take a different approach um, than to stay the course with that one. work with industry on this uh, program is going to look like going forward? Um, uh, the AOC one? Yes. I, I really can't. I am not involved or directly in that on a daily basis. So I, you know, I think probably better for Steve Wirt or Ms. Costello to answer that question. Okay. Colin? Uh, General, thanks for coming as a uh, amorphous uh, Hill staffer. There's Nothing I love to talk about more than agile software development. And, uh, <laughs> Pretty boring topic, huh? <laughs> well, we, we, we've seen the successes and the progress that DevOps had with OCX. So there's certainly a business case aligned to support what you're arguing here for. Um, in a different program, and I'll leave the organization and the program out of it, for example, they're trying to implement agile software development. And they came to uh, you know, brief congressional staff on here's our progress and schedule, you know, we're programmed, where's the waterfall chart, and that's how we do our oversight, that's how we communicate to members, how things are going well or not. You can see on the schedule, we had some problems, there's no milestones, no nothing, but one year from now we're going to be doing okay. <laughs> And it was sort of that trust issue that you brought up, mm -hmm. and I, I think you've got the business case behind you that says we should, the, you know, the Congress, certainly at the, you know, peon staffer level should be trusting you. However, there's no accountability built into it that we can say, yeah. hey, come, how do we know? Well, my first that? reaction to that, and I don't know the program, although I can probably guess what organization it is, is that, you know, remember what I just talked about, delivering, or delivering working software is, I would actually go back and say, well, a year's a long time in, a, in an agile software development process. <coughs> you know, there's got to be something in between that, that they can be able to demonstrate to you that they're, that they're delivering, right? If it's taken them a year before they actually get anything into the hands of the operator, then I guess I got some concerns about their, their application of agile software development appropriation side and the squirrely green eye shade FM side when you talk about color of money I'm climbing I know I know right I know now. that's why I, I said it comfortable yep. and I see Mr. Rogers and I'm like, yeah, I'm like oh god what do? <laughs> um, but I hear you but as you I would uh, in encourage your staff that as they make these proposals and these pathfinders to sort of build in that, okay, we might need to muck around with color money, we might need to do this, but here's where the new accountability is, here's how, yeah. here's how we think that oversight can play so that our members can be confident that in this brave new world, you know, that started 12 years ago and the Department of Defense and the Congress are just catching up to, uh, can stay on top of it. You know, I'm, I, 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 I agree with you, and, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things that I've said that you know, there's there's some things you have to think about, um, and that one I I have to I've thought about that one. You know, how do you? I mean, because it's like I said, I I'm not comfortable saying just throw O and M money at it because you know you've got to have some way of understanding that you're actually getting what you think you you paid for. And I get, go back to those basic tenets that that the measure of success is is working software in the hands of the operator. And so, in my view. Um, the key is being able to look at those requirements and, if you will, break them up in a way that you are incrementally fielding capability and increments that are significantly smaller, maybe, than the way we've thought about this in the past. You know, we got into incremental acquisition is not new, right? We've talked about that. But we've always talked about, I mean, GPS-3 originally started with an A, B, and C, right, Al? And uh, you know we never got past A, um, 
but but A was like a four-year program. You know, so when we talk about agile software development, A is probably maybe six months, right? So that's where I worry a little bit about that timeline. But I think that I'd, I'd say we have to, and that's one of the discussions that I have talked about. What's your metrics? How do you measure that you're successful? But I keep going back to those, um, you know, those basic tenets. And my measure of success should be the re the speed that you know the amount of capability that I have delivered in an amount of time, with a quality and a satisfaction by by the customer. So how do we do that without requiring an independent tester to write a report that takes them, you know, four months even after they've done their testing, and then one can make a decision to accept it, right? So we've got to be able to, to capture the quality and the effectiveness of the product we deliver so that we can communicate to you. And even the authorizers would like to be sure that we're spending the money on what we said we are and we're getting a product from it, right? So I think that's, that's the key part of working through this is to build that trust, but to have it, it to, to, to have a way to measure our effectiveness that doesn't create a huge volume of documentation and, and delays in order to, to communicate it, if that makes any sense. But I don't have all the answers. But, I, but my view is if I don't start down this path, it's kind of like agile software development, right? Let's give it a try. We may have to circle back and say, oh, well, that didn't, that, you know, that wasn't. But if you fail early, which is, you know, the TomTom -tom approach, then you have more time to, and you haven't spent as much money uh, getting there. Couple more yes. Kind of from the Aerospace Corporation. So I would like to, um, I think the vision that you've outlined is really, really um, quite ambitious and really in the agile. I think the, the examples that you've given, like OCX and GMS, use my vernacular, I would call them hybrids because they're using agile at the software level, but they're still um, as you said, in a, are kind of encumbered by the system engineering process. So I'm, I'm wondering, the Pathfinder that you mentioned, I'm wondering what you have in mind, and if you think we really can get to that, you know, the ultimate agile. Yeah, well, I agree with you that if you try to tackle the most difficult challenge, the most complex challenge um, with a Pathfinder, then you may not learn anything. Um, so, what I'm trying to do is, is a Pathfinder that is on, the, um, on a, a, a weapon system that is very software intensive. Um, but, you know, OCX, you might argue, is a bit of a Pathfinder even today that is testing some pieces of, of Agile. But I'm looking at a different one, and I, I don't, ha don't want to talk about the details of what that might be because it's still very much in the in the storming phase and then I'm also looking at one on the business system side and the business system side I think is much which is as you heard me earlier say is one that we ought to be able to do this um, and because even when you look at the business system side there's the risk equation not to say that business systems can't be risky uh, you know when you make a mistake on them but you know, I, I have to admit, I myself am a little nervous about doing agile software development, even on an operational flight profile, and finding out I did something wrong by losing an airplane. And then, you know, in the in the space business, the software for the satellite, same thing, right? So we have to have a little bit of a calibration when we say accepting risk, because for us the consequences of accepting risk can be very, very extreme. So that's the part that I personally, you know, as an engineer struggle with when it comes to that. But, but the one Pathfinder will be a business system. Um, and the one I'm, and that's one I'm willing to share because I'm a little closer along. What I'm looking at there is to help myself every once in a while. It's a good thing to be your own customer, right? Which is logistic systems. Um, we have over 200 plus logistic systems to operate our Air Force. And oh, by the way, I have to be audit ready. And to be audit ready, I have to be able to account for where every dollar is. 
and where it went. Think about the nightmare of that with 200 different business systems associated with logistics. So one of my pathfinders is in, it will be essentially an in-house effort using some of those 3,000 software coders we have already to, to work on logistics command and control. And again, there I will be able to break the, you know, I have a little ability to, to an try to answer some of the questions that Colin had. How do I know I've been successful? You know, how big is too big? You know, for in terms of, a, of, a, of an increment or a scrum or whatever the latest phraseology you want to use. Uh, but I agree with you that um, it, it's a challenge, but, but I put it to you because sometimes we're going to have to think about this from the beginning. You know, traditionally we build all the hardware and the money goes to the hardware, and then we're like, oh man, we got to do the software now, right? Sibbers, GPS. So, that's where some of this is going to have to start, you know, the Pathfinder are going to be smaller things that enable us to then learn what, how do I do some of these things in our risk environment, in our construct, so that I can then expand it to the, to the bigger ones. With that, General Polakowski, I want to thank you very much for coming All in right, here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>